Hello to my folks who are here on the YouTube video. Welcome to another episode of Voicing Artists Original Characters. We are working with this, I would say beautiful, we are working with this incredible, detailed, artistic drawing that is a little bit creepy, a little bit odd, and the color scheme is interesting, and the way that the features are shaped and drawn is unique. We're working with a very cool, for lack of a better term, art piece. So the artist for this piece today uh, her name is Coley, or Senpai Broccoli is the username online. Pronoun she, her. Now, she did give me some sort of background universe history for this drawing. And the reason why I don't necessarily say this character, although I probably will a couple of times, is because this drawing sort of encompasses multiple things at once versus it being like, this is a specific character that we're going to work with and talk about and they live in a universe and they dress a certain way and think a certain way and do all those things. This is more of an art piece that focuses on feelings and emotions and a theme and an environment. So that's what we're going to sort of work with rather than necessarily specifics of a character. So the information that Coley did give me is that this artwork is meant to represent a bad feeling or a sadness and anxiety that's always there for people. And even though we might try to ignore that sadness or that anxiety, it's always in the back of our mind watching us. It's with us. It's hiding out in a corner, just waiting to sort of take control or speak its mind or have its way, right? And that anxiety or the badness or the sadness, whatever you want to call it, ends up coming out at some point in some way, shape, or form, even if you don't want it to. And that is the representation of this creature or this darker version of our young lady here crawling sort of out of this mirror. She is the embodiment of that sadness, that anxiety, those intrusive thoughts, those negative emotions expelling themselves even when we don't want to. It can't be contained. And the reason why it comes out of a sort of mini compact mirror is because oftentimes uh, you fully understand yourself and every part of yourself when these negative emotions and these negative feelings are released. So it's your true self being whole with not just the good things, not just the happy things, but also the sad things and the anxieties and things like that. That is your whole person. And you sort of have to acknowledge them and you have to accept them in order to be a, I was going to say secluded. No, in order to be a solidified entirety of yourself of your soul you can't just ignore it you can't just throw it away so that's your true self and oftentimes that comes out when you're looking in a mirror and you see yourself and you're thinking to yourself and you're talking to yourself and so you're sort of acknowledging this person that exists versus you almost have a mask on and you try to be perfect or pretend that those things don't exist uh, in the normal world, which is when she is not holding up this mirror in the other half. So that was the background and history that the artist gave me for this artwork here. And I think it's a lovely explanation of sort of the unique feelings that we get from this drawing. Um, and I really like when artists go into mind I like when artists go into drawing something with the mindset of a theme or a concept or an idea rather than necessarily specific character traits. Rather than being like, oh, she's this height and this weight and this hair color and this eye color and likes these things and dislikes these things. It's just a feeling. And we're going to be using that word a lot today. <laughs> so I hope you're prepared. But that sort of vibe and energy to go in with that mindset instead of specifics can often give you incredible pieces of artwork 
that are just sort of your emotions and your inner self on a paper. And I think that's what's happened here with Coley's artwork. Um, and they created an incredible piece for us to work with. And we are going to poke around and push around into this piece and give life to those inner thoughts, those inner demons, and to the person themselves. So it'll be a nice combination here. So one thing that I thought was interesting about Coley's notes for the mirror, where you look in a mirror and that's your true self because of it's all of the things combined, is that there could also be something to say here with the idea of a mirror or your eyes, because this mirror is sort of held up to her eye, being the window to the soul. And, you know, they say that you can't see, like, vamp vampires can't see themselves in a mirror. You can't see a vampire in a mirror because they're soulless, right? Um, they're undead. They don't have that anymore. They don't have that piece of them. And so I think there could be something to play with about mirrors being this beautiful connection to the soul, your inner self, your true self, in the way that they were saying. So just a little note that I thought of when they were talking about that. Now let's go into some personality descriptions for both the main girl and the girl, I'm going to call her the girl in the mirror. Um, I think this is going to be interesting because we have a lot of room to play here. Because again, this is a piece of artwork that's created with a vibe and an energy, not necessarily with a character in mind. This is just a way to embody that emotion and feeling. So we get to know what those emotions and feelings are, know what the thought process was, and then determine what we think the characters that have come from this creative process would be like. So that's what we're gonna do. So for our main girl here, this is the one holding the mirror, looks a little nervous, looks a little upset. I have some things. So nervous is of course the first on my list. You can see looking at her, she is shaken. Her lip is raised and her mouth is open in like a ah, type of energy. Her eye is wide open and surprised. Um, I think there's fear in there as well. I would say insecure. I would say unstable, perfectionist, um, close-mouthed, and tight-lipped. Now, when I say this, let's get a little more in-depth. When I say closed-mouthed and tight-lipped, um, I don't mean that she naturally doesn't speak or she's naturally a quiet person. I mean that she doesn't speak up and she doesn't say things and she doesn't express her emotions and she doesn't express her viewpoints because she is forcing herself to hold it back because she is afraid of what other people will think of how she feels. You know, she probably doesn't want to be a burden. She probably doesn't want other people to hate her. Maybe some of her anxieties are things like, oh, you're stupid. No one cares what you think you should keep quiet, like keep your mouth shut. They don't care about you, right? And all these things are sort of reveling in this anxiety that's in her head. And so she is forcing herself to keep her mouth closed and to not say things and just give simple answers and simple I'm fines and things like that. And I think that goes into the concept of her feeling a bit unstable and her being a bit of a perfectionist because people would see her as a perfectionist or see her as normal but she is trying to be like a perfect neutral there's nothing wrong with me nothing's going on I'm just like everybody else because she's so worried about what all these people will think about the things that her anxiety is telling her and when you zip that up and you bottle that up you start to get a little unstable. You start to get a little paranoid. You get into this shaky mind of, if I let this loose, is it over? And that will bubble and bubble and boil and toil and trouble until it bursts. And I think that's where the insta instability comes from. I will also say, because this is a bit more of an exaggerated drawing, I think we can take these aspects of insecurity, being unstable, um, and things that align with that, and 
exaggerate them to the hundreds and thousands and millions degrees. Because if this was just a realistic drawing of a girl with the mirror and sort of anxiety creature comes out, maybe we'd make it a little more tame. But I adore how almost squirmy this art style is for this image and how the fingers almost feel elongated and there's a lot of like sweat dripping off and you can feel the textures. It's like the emotion is radiating off her and because it's so strong and something about it just feels off in the way that it's drawn, I think we should lean into that with the characters and treat it almost as if it's a um, Junji Ito style drawing where it's ooh, 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 ooh is the energy you're getting and we are over the top, exaggerated, intense with our performances. So I think I want to do that for these characters. Some other things about this main girl, um, she seems very drained or exhausted as in keeping up this facade of nothing is wrong and I am okay is literally mentally and physically tearing her down and draining her and exhausting her. I mean, we can see the sweat drops, but just as I was saying earlier, we have lines on her face. We have the hair going sort of almost in all directions. We have like these beautiful details of color and darkness and shading and just all of it makes you feel like she's very weak in this state that she's in. So I think she's very exhausted. I will also say we might be able to play with the idea that she is vacant. She is there in some sense, but the reality of it is when you put on a facade for so long, you detach yourself from the outside world. You detach yourself from real people. And so part of you that interacts with these people has to be gone. It has to be just automatic. So she's vacant in this space because she's so focused on trying to cover everything up. And so it's like she shut everything off, not just the anxiety, but everything. The happiness, the excitement, the love, the thrill, every other good emotion that comes with the anxiety or is a part of her life got turned off when she was trying to hide the anxiety. So I think that could be a part of it. Okay, now let's talk about the bad thing, um, the anxiety, whatever you want to call it, this creature that is coming out of this mirror and has this sinister smile on its face, these glowing eyes, and is almost a darker blue um, version of herself, which makes sense if we're going with anxiety and depression and things like that. So this creature is obviously an agitator. It stirs up trouble, it pushes people's buttons, and it doesn't shut the hell up. <laughs> now, when I say that, I don't mean like, I talk really fast and I keep talking and I never blah, 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 blah. No, I actually think this character might turn out to naturally be very slow in the way that they speak, but we'll see when we play with it. What I mean when I say an agitator who pushes people's buttons, stirs up trouble and won't stop talking, all sorts of things, what I'm getting at here is that this creature is the type that doesn't back down. It doesn't matter how many times you tell it you're fine. It doesn't matter how many times you tell it it's lying or you're not listening or you try to shut it off or anything under the sun. It is there. It doesn't care. It is poking and poking and poking like a little chronic pain that just won't go away. So that's what I mean by an agitator, just stirring the pot ever so slightly every day with the smallest of mistakes, maybe even not a mistake, and it still agitates it. That's what we want. I also think this would be paralyzing, right? That goes with our vacant where it's sort of like she's not there anymore because it has frozen her into this state of I can't interact. I think it's agonizing. It's not just agitating, but it's agonizing. It's painful, at least mentally, if not physically. It is a consistent 
sore pain versus a sharp needle sting. So I don't think it's something that's necessarily going jab, 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 jab. I think it's something that like you wake up in the morning and every muscle in your body is sore. And it doesn't matter what you do, heat, ice, anything, you go to bed and you're sore. You wake up and you're aching again. That, that I think is this anxiety. I don't think it's a stabby. Maybe every once in a while it stabs you, right? But I think mostly this is just consistent, unwanted pain and anxiety. There's one word in here I'm gonna skip. I'll get back to it in a second. You'll see why. I wanna say oppressive because oppressive and overwhelming is what anxiety is in a nutshell. And there's no way that this creature embodying it wouldn't be the type of oppressive where it's not like it's physically going to smother you, but it's there for so long and it's so heavy and it's such a burden that eventually you just kind of cave in and you let it win. And so it becomes so oppressive. Now, these other ones that I'm about to give are going to be more on the way that this is drawn than on anything personality wise. Now these words are helpful for me because I like to use all sorts of language when I create characters and I create voices. They might not be helpful for the average person, but the last words that I would use for this artwork is gloopy, slimy, gummy, and viscous. Okay. What in the hell am I trying to say with those words? Well, they all sort of mean a similar thing. In my mind, when I look at this artwork, the way that it's drawn is everything is sort of coming downwards in a slow fashion. There are little pieces of the hair that sort of curl just at the ends as if you took slime or gel and you ran it down the hair to make it look wet and damp and soaking and then you just pop at the end and it feels sticky and there's sort of like touching it is like gloopy and slimed and the hair sort of comes out of the mirror and goes up a little bit like that as well and the sweat sort of dragging on her face, the way that even her face and her eyes themselves kind of look a little wet with the gloss that's on there. Her shirt feels like it's drooping downwards and there's all of these different, uh, the texture in it, there's all of these different wrinkles that are sort of like on top of each other. And on her hand, she's got for the glow on these knuckles make it feel very like it's sort of curling inwards and downwards and even this mirror piece that she's holding looks scratched and a little dingy and it's not quite a circle right and so all of this in the artwork and in the drawing just gives me very putting your hands in a slime or a gel bucket and dragging them back out and watching it all fall off of you and how it goes in like little clumps to the ground and it just sticks to you and drags on you wherever you go and it never stops. You can never seem to get rid of it. You will find it on every piece of clothing. You take 20 showers, you clean yourself up and it's just still there. That is what the way that this is drawn and the motion in it and the color palette in it, making it look wet and damp and sticky gives to me. And that's why I use these words. And for me, these words are helpful when creating a voice because I'm going to take this feeling, which remember this artwork piece was made through a feeling and a concept, not just for the characters. I'm going to take this feeling and concept that sits so strongly with me which is slimy and viscous, which essentially just means thick material, thick liquidy material and gloopy. And I'm gonna add them into the texture of the sound of my voice and maybe even the way that this creature speaks and things of that nature. 
So that is why I include those words, and that is why I think they're important. <laughs> okay. So we got our water, and we're going to go into voicing these characters. So for our main girl, I'm thinking that we should give her not too high of a pitch. I don't know that too high of a pitch would be helpful. So I'm wondering if maybe we sort of do a middle tone, but just make her a bit softer. So for example, if I was gonna go into the high pitch characters that we usually do, right? I would be up here in this range and we'd be very high, almost in child territory. But we don't want that for her. She's definitely got more of a, you know, like adult, maybe a little gothy, punky feel. Um, even with the anxiety that she has. So I don't quite want that voice. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to that pitch and take out a little bit of the squeak and I think make it a little softer. So if we do, we're up here and we're doing this and then we go into a bit of a softer voice rather than squeaky and nasally. This could be where she's at if we want her to be a little anxious and a little bit softer, but still have a higher pitch. So that could work. And I think that that could do well. I still think maybe it's a bit high, um, but it might be okay if we bring the anxiety into it, it might end up resonating a little bit stronger. So if we bring in the anxiety and we can do that, uh, I think the easiest way for me to do that personally is to add in breath, because I think the more breath that you add, the more panicky that you can sound. So if we add in the breath here, it might do a little bit better. Eh, it might do a little bit better. Betty Botter bought some butter. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that, I promise. Um, and we'll see how it sounds. So we're up here in this higher pitch. And we're a little bit softer in our voice instead of nasally. But we're going to add in a lot of breath when we talk in order to get more of that anxiety feeling. And I'm not sure if it's working or not. There it is. I think maybe that's a bit more anxious and her saying that she's fine and okay and everything will be all right. Yeah, there we go. That's the anxiety I wanted. Okay, so our main girl, we're gonna do some of our emotions here. So happy, uh, angry, sad is usually what we go with. And I think happy is gonna be actually one of the harder ones for this character because this artwork is based upon anxiety. So she's very anxious, she's very nervous, and we know that she's putting on this mask of perfectionism, of trying to pretend that nothing is wrong and that everything is fine. So trying to get to a genuine happy when you have this wall up that is very fake and very facade-like might be a little difficult. So what do we think could make her genuinely happy. Or we could give her a facade version of that happy. Either one would work. We usually try to stick to genuine happy, but I'm not opposed to giving her sort of this facade. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. You might be able to do something along the lines of the voices have quieted. I, he I hesitate to say the voices have stopped because do they ever really stop? Um, but I think having a moment where her mind is quieted and she just feels like she can fully for once relax would be a happy moment, a genuine happy moment. And I think there's going to be a lot of relief in this moment. And I think there's going to be a lot of calm in this moment, which is not something you find when you have anxiety. Um, so let's give it a shot here. I think I wanna add some breath in here and let's see what we can do. I don't hear them anymore. The voices, they... They've quieted. <laughs> it's been so long since I've had a thought to myself. 
myself. It's nice. It's really nice. Oh, I like that. I like that quite a bit, actually. Aw. <laughs> I was sitting here thinking for a second, like, maybe there should be something more thrown into it. Maybe there should be, you know, more energy or more of a weird voice or something along those lines. But honestly, I think it's perfect for her. I think the only reason that my brain is considering it weird is because we're starting with the emotion that is not natural to her. And that feels, that may be why it feels strange to start in this place of, ooh, I don't feel like there's enough happening because we haven't lived in her as her natural state yet. But that was so nice and gentle. And it felt kind of like those ASMR relaxing things where they're just like, and breathe in, breathe out, right? And that was her space for that. And I like that quite a bit. So I think we're going to keep that for happy. I actually really like it. Um, so what that means is we have angry and sad to play with. So we're going to kind of play with these. We're going to kind of not. Since we have both of these characters, we're going to do a bit more of mixing and intertwining the two together. So especially for these two stronger generally speaking, more negative emotions. Um, we're gonna play with both of them, I think. So I think we're going to start with our main girl for anger, um, where she is going to sort of give this energy of like, I'm upset this thing happened. Uh, and it might even be a bit of sadness mixed with anger. And then our anxiety creature is going to come out and start giving these intrusive thoughts. Um, and I do want to be clear that these are intrusive thoughts, right? Lots of us have these where things that your brain says that you know aren't true, you don't actually believe them, you don't want to think them, but they are there. A lot of folks with anxiety and depression and uh, other neurodivergencies will know those intrusive thoughts. Um, and intrusive thoughts are not like, oh, you should eat that candy when you're on a diet, right? Intrusive thoughts are dark and they're deep and they can be scary and they can be hurtful. And I think that's what we're playing with here are those type of thoughts. So just for a warning that we're going to go into some of those for these. So for anger... I think the best way to have these two interplay a little bit and intermix with each other would be if she is upset um, that she... What could she be upset about? That's a good question. Ooh. That might work for sadness, though. I had an idea where maybe she is not angry, but she is nervous. And then the anxiety creature mutates those nerves into other emotions, um, which I do like, but I don't know that it would fit for angry. I think maybe if we're going to do angry, we should do something where she is upset at herself and the anxiety creature then starts doubling down on herself to be like, yeah, you're the worst thing ever, right? When in reality, she probably didn't do anything. So it needs to be something simple and small that maybe she's upset about because it broke her sort of facade of protection. So something simple that maybe would make her upset would be if she, what could she do? Okay, let's make it something simple and maybe something a little irrational. Because I think with the anxieties and everything and her trying to keep up this persona and keep the anxieties down, she believes that everything needs to go off exactly the correct way or something could slip and someone will 
learn that she has these thoughts and these emotions in her head. So I'm going to go with something very simple and then I'm going to go into the anxiety voice and let them join together a little bit. So for our anxiety voice, for the anxiety voice, I think that what I'm going to do is take what is almost her voice and just sort of slow it down and maybe gargle with it a little bit, make it a little gargly, a little scratchy, a little a little tainted, sort of the way that this creature is coming out that looks like her and is her, but is darkened and has claws on the end of her fingers, right? So if this is her voice, where it's here and it's a little breathy and a little nervous and really doesn't want to be this way, then I might make the anxiety voice. Oh, but you know you have to be, don't you? You're just a stupid little girl. Where it's the same pitch, it's kind of got uh, the same tonality, but it's it's gargling you can hear the rough road um and it's slower and it's still got a little bit of air but it's a lot more powerful sounds a lot stronger because it's placed a little bit more uh, it's probably placed it's about the same area but it's got a sense to it where it has a bit more groundedness and a bit more strength in it um than hers does with all of the breath and the airiness you sort of take the majority of that out and switch it for gargle rocky road and that leans towards more of the control so i think that's what we're gonna do let's make it something simple like she um wore the same outfit to school right and um someone comments on I don't know. Someone comments on the fact that uh, she wore the same shirt, right? She wore that shirt yesterday. And then all of a sudden these things start to crumble in her brain of like, I'm so stupid. Why did I not do that? Oh my God. And that's what we're going to go with. So let's see if we can do this here. Is it the... Is this the same shirt as yesterday? <laughs> um... Uh, I... Um... No, 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 of, of course not. I... Um... I just keep more than one pair, that's all. I have... I have two of the same shirt. <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. Why am I so stupid? I can't believe I forgot to change clothes from yesterday. Such a stupid, simple mistake. Now they're gonna know. Now they're gonna know. Now I've ruined everything. You have ruined everything, huh? How could you be so stupid as to wear the same shirt? And your excuse? <sighs> I have two pairs of this shirt. <laughs> you think anyone will buy that? Bullshit. We both know you're just a dumb little girl. Oh, soon they'll see the real you. The real, ugly, terrifying monster inside. <laughs> Ooh! I'm about to get a drink of water, but 
but I'm afraid if I drink, get a drink of water, that voice is not gonna be here. <laughs> and that was a real exploration of what do we feel like this anxiety would sound like. And we had that starting base point of her voice, but kind of gravelly and a little less breathy and a little slower. But something that you heard while I was doing it was the uh, noises. Um, and those came naturally and instinctively, which is my favorite type of voice recording. And where they came from was, you see her mouth here? Now this is just like the art style, right? But when I'm looking at that from the distance we had the picture, it almost looks like she's got the top lip of her mouth. It's like a little rodent. You don't have to agree with me, but the little top piece of her mouth there feels very like rodent lifting their lip and they've got like little teeth under and they're almost like growling. Um, and that's where the comes from because that when I was looking at this image gave and especially with the nose being just a little baby mark gave me this feeling of like an animalistic like creature and so I just sort of lifted and went and got that little noise in there um, and these are things, you know, things that you can pick up on that enhance the way that you perform and the character voices that you make. Um, and they're all selective. Obviously, the artist gives us a lot of things to play with, right? Where everybody should be having the same general ideas about a character based on the way that the artist has drawn the artwork. But individualized portrayals come from these little experiences and life lessons and learnings that we have and associations that we have as people that we throw into these things. Someone else is going to look at her mouth and not see a rodent, right? Um, but that's what I saw in this creature. And so to make her a bit more animalistic, I just naturally did that instead of a laugh, right? Because she was going to laugh in those moments, but she didn't. She did the little noise because I saw the rodent. And so these things help give you more character, personality, and individualization when you go to voice something. And there's never a wrong or a right. It's just how do you see it? So there we go. So we can classify that into anger. It's a little bit more of a mix of things happening, which is what I like for this one in particular. Um, but I think it falls into anger because we started there because she was sort of angry with herself and not thinking well enough. So let's start with sadness then in that same way where it sort of um, comes from her or comes from the creature and then it can mold into other things as they sort of interact with each other. Um, so sadness. Now here's the thing with sadness. When you are consistently in this state, even when you're trying to block it off and pretend it doesn't exist, when you consistently have these sort of emotions that hang off of you, um, you are kind of genuinely sad a lot. And it becomes a part of this persistency. And the more something happens, the more we get used to it, in quotes. Um, that doesn't mean it gets better just because you get used to it. It just means that you're used to it. So I think there's a lot of things that we could pull from for her being in a sad place. But I'm wondering if maybe... I'm wondering how to bring the creature into this. If her state is already going to be sad, how do we bring the creature into this? Creature definitely would amplify and agitate the sadness that is within her. So, I have an idea. Okay. I have an idea. We're gonna go back to happy. We're gonna make our baseline in order to get too sad, we're gonna start with happy. Because I think what I wanna do here is I wanna bring her, um, I want the anxiety to take her happiness, right? It sort of crawls out of this mirror and it grabs onto this like little speck of happiness and it just sort of 
puts its fingers in it. We are talking about it giving me the energy of slime and goo and, ugh, and it just sort of squeezes everything. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have the anxiety put their hands into her happiness like it's a bucket of slime. Like she just sort of comes out of this mirror and she just goes, oh look happiness, what if I just and there's just like, you could see the fingers going into like, ugh, that kind of energy. That's what I want her to do to this happiness. I, I don't want it to just be, no, you're sad. No, you're stupid. No, because it's not a jabby thing, right? This creature is very slow. It's very uh, chronic. It's not fast. It's not spiky. It's going to drain you like very slowly with every ounce. That's kind of how anxiety is. Sometimes you can get into panic where it's faster, but oftentimes anxiety is like creeping. So here's my plan. Here's my thought process. I'm going to start her with, I like the idea maybe um, for something that would make her happy uh, because she's putting on this fake persona and she doesn't want anyone to see or to know of what she really feels with this anxiety and this depression. Um, I think that she would be happy if someone had perchance seen just a glimpse of it and still continued to like her still continue to be like no it's it, it's okay that you're sad sometimes right like I'm not just gonna leave you because you're sad um I'm still friends with you like it's okay and I think that genuine act of kindness and acknowledging her as a person would make her happy and in order to crush that happiness <laughs> we gotta make her happy first so <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so let's make her genuinely happy. Let's see if we can play with it a bit. And then I'll see if I can push in the anxiety voice. Uh, and let's, let's improv, let's try this. You, you still wanna be friends with me? Even after all I, all I did and, and, and the things that I said, you, you're still here. <laughs> I, um, I've never had anyone be so kind before. <laughs> Thank you. She is lying to you. And you know it. Who in their right mind would ever love someone? doing voices because sometimes they get me too because <laughs> like I just went all right what's the worst thing that I could say to someone who's happy uh and I just said it and then the second like my brain came back to being me I went oh no <laughs> so she's wearing a cross um I'm wondering if it might be interesting to do a line or two where she is reaching out to God 
and asking him maybe for help because I know a lot of folks who grow up spiritually um, regardless of what religion they are and when they struggle with anxiety and depression it can really take a toll on your faith and your spirituality because you can feel like you are not being heard sometimes you can even feel abandoned from the god that you might believe in um and feel like you're sort of being left behind and that you need help um so i want to do this a little emotional i think i want to do a bit of her reaching out like genuinely reaching out to god and asking him for help and this might even tie a little bit into our sadness line maybe she's a little sad about him not she believes he's not hearing her um let's let's give that a shot and maybe the creature will come in maybe it won't um but but let's play with her for a second let's see i i don't know if you listen to my prayers anymore but i i really could use your help today um i just i, I don't feel i don't f feel the same and uh, maybe maybe this is stupid. I don't know. But it's gotten a lot harder to pretend that I'm okay when I'm not okay. And I just, I really need you to hear me, please. Because I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to, to do. And I... I don't know that you're there anymore. Or that, that you ever were to begin with. Maybe, maybe you just made me this way. But if, if you made me this way, then why aren't you here to help me with it? Did I do something wrong? I must have done something wrong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't ask again. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> Damn. When I do these these improv lines and, and these episodes for these characters, I try to do a little bit of, not planning, but I do a little bit of work of write, you know, what the voice may sound like. Um, but I try to also let a lot of things come naturally while we're doing it. And so I was kind of letting it, um, yeah, because when I was doing it, I wanted it to be, if the creature came in, I wanted it to be a natural, instinctive decision on when or where or how the creature came into the piece. And the creature did not come in because it felt so personal between her and who she was speaking to that I don't think the creature had a place there. Um, and I think even with the things that she was saying, the things that she was saying almost lean into what the creature says, where the creature is talking about how she's not good enough and they're in the God doesn't hear her, right? And, and no one loves her. The same things that she's sort of having a communication with in prayer. She's saying some of these things of like, maybe it is my fault, you know? Um, and I 
didn't feel like that needed to be the creature saying it. I felt like it needed to be her saying it because at the end of the day, they are the same. They are the same, right? The anxiety, the depression, the intrusive thoughts, the things that we sort of push out of our brain and wish that weren't there are still a part of us. And one of the things that the artist mentioned, um, they're one in the same, the creature is here. The creature's thoughts and feelings are with her at all times. Um, but the embodiment of that creature doesn't necessarily have to come forth when she has already ingrained those words into her mindset and her feelings rather than just a little voice that's saying hey 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 some of these things this voice says she already believes and so she's already saying them one of the things the artist said when we were working uh in the earlier uh hour with this uh, drawing and these characters is they said that the reason why the creature comes out of a mirror is because the creature is the embodiment of anxiety in these thoughts and you are not truly whole you are not yourself without these thoughts and these negative things so she's coming out of a mirror the same way you sort of see your true self and your soul in your reflection because you can't just ignore them you can't just pretend they don't exist all of it is you and so her being the ones to have some of these things ingrained and her saying them and not the creature circle us back around to this idea of no you can't just shut it out it's a part of you too, and you have to acknowledge it, you have to accept it, and you have to work through it in whatever way is healthy and works for you. Wow, I love that. I love when these episodes are a genuine place to talk and experience emotions and you know thought processes and philosophize a little bit. <laughs> Wow, I love that very, very much. But I, I think, I think that puts a good cap onto this artwork piece and this character, because I, I really liked where we left off, and I don't want to, I don't want to mess with it too much. So this is Senpai Broccoli or Coley. Um, the two names that she gave me so you can find her on Instagram um, and she does have a card for some other things but she's got gorgeous artwork here most of them in this style of like what we were talking about earlier with the very creepy sort of uh, comic artisty style um, so very very cool very very gorgeous artwork um, very macabre but thank you to Senpai Broccoli uh, for letting us work with her characters and her artwork piece. I appreciate you. And for my little YouTube outro, to everybody who watched the finalized video, thank you very much. Remember to join us here live while recording and you can join us in the discussion and help create lines and things like that. But if not, I will see you next week in the next video. Goodbye.